You want to see some propaganda? Because I got some propaganda to show you. So, Foreign Policy Magazine uh, shares this article here. Um, and this article is uh, an article shaming Germany for daring to potentially uh, lower the foreign aid to Ukraine. Um, and it's framed incredibly emotionally, manipulatively, and dishonestly. And I thought I would uh, share this with you, in addition to some other facts. Just interesting facts about what has surrounded the war, and what has caused this, uh, this sort of sentiment surrounding uh, Ukraine funding to be as prevalent as it is. Because let me tell you, um, it's not organic. It's not like the common person would be involved in this, be invested in this otherwise. Um, but the West has a very specific choice of foreign partner. And here is an example of how they will treat you if you dare go against the narrative. Why Germany has learned the wrong lessons from history. And the, the, <laughs> the name of the article that you can only see on the upper bar which I'm not going to show because I have way too many tabs open. Um, German complacency dangerously emboldens Russia. Foreign policy magazine, y'all. Uh, on Russia and Ukraine, Germans remain wedded to historical and geopolitical delusions. So what does this have to say other than... Uh, clearly mocking somebody for their bald head. You'll notice that they leave it like they cut it off right below his chin. They're trying to send a very specific message. Oh, old man. Old man not ready for new war. Uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz briefs the press on Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the German Chancellery on Berlin on February 24th. So the article basically provides... Um, this emotional appeal, starting with a fucking poem, um, right? And it eventually gets to where it says, military spending, never popular, went out of fashion, having to barely 1% of GDP by 2005. In the modern world, German policy wonks piously intoned, problems should be solved by dialogue, not anachronistic confrontation. The way to avoid conflict was to boost trade and investment. Russia would never attack its customers. We see now how that worked out. Germany is scrambling to disengage itself from Russian energy supplies and increasingly worries about its dependence on China. <laughs> Throughout these years, a pervasive climate of anti-Americanism in Germany stoked moral equivalence in whataboutism. Yes, the Putin regime has its flaws, but what about the U.S.? With its failed wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, its overmighty security state. Many Germans regard Edward Snowden, the U.S. NSA contractor who leaked classified information and sought asylum in Russia, as a hero. And alarming, rebarbative figures such as President George W. Bush and Donald Trump? Germans wallow in guilt about their country's Nazi-era crimes, but are barely aware that World War II brought far more death and destruction to Ukraine than to the territories that now comprise the Russian Federation. And so what, he, what it's saying is that if you don't... If you don't support massive increases in the defense budget in your country... You're helping support fascism. You're dangerously close to the <laughs> Russian support that started to underpin World War II and Nazism. So the less conflict Germany wants, the more Nazi they are. Do you recognize how insane that is? 
how unhinged and delusional that is, there is no way for them to not be Nazis. Because if they support uh, the war effort, then they're supporting Ukrainian Nazis. If they don't, and like that, that's what one side will say, and they're closer to the truth than this by a damn sight. <clears throat> and if they don't support the war, then they're Nazis, because they're getting too close to how Nazis in Russia were. What? Because they're getting too close to how Ukraine was in battle during World War II. What? Anyone else remember that thing where NATO uh, tweeted out a video supporting literal Nazis because they were Ukrainian? This is, this is historical whitewashing. It's the claim that there's some, like, benevolent good guy. Meanwhile, you want to bring up the Bushes, I regularly cover that Prescott Bush himself was the reason for Holocaust Steel Movement. He was the reason for Holocaust Steel Movement, and an, an entire American family of CIA directors, Skull and Bones associates, presidents, New World Order advocates, troops... An entire family of people like that got their initial wealth off Nazi money. Um, so the West is replete with Nazi help. America and NATO are Nazi laundering organizations with the Bundeswehr and the Galen organization and NASA and all of these institutions that were like, hey, yeah, you Nazis, you're cool with us. You were just in the Wehrmacht. <laughs> you know? Or you just helped man a concentration camp. You're fine by us. That's how the West was. And now for Foreign Policy Magazine to come along and say, hey, yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're too against war uh, in the present day, and you would rather divert funds to causes in your domestic needs. Um, so you're too much like Nazis. That's insane. And, and to, to just hammer the nails in this coffin here, let me just bring up this next article from the same magazine, Foreign Policy Magazine, where it celebrates arms spending. And it says, I'm not making this up, yo. The arsenal of democracy is back in business. Um, proposed... U.S. arms sales to NATO almost doubled this past year as Russia's aggression spooked the continent. Woo! The U.S. doubled its arms sales to NATO. We did it. <laughs> We're back in business, baby! We got them. We got a bunch of money off of wars. That's celebrating. They're celebrating. They're not being nuanced. They're saying it's great. We did it. We got the money back into fucking bombs. And it says, The United States nearly doubled the number and price tag of approved arms sales to NATO allies in 2022 compared with 21 as alliance members scramble to stock up on high-end weapons in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine. In 2021, the U.S. government approved 14 possible major arms sales to NATO allies worth around $15.5 billion. In 2022, that jumped up to 24 possible major arms sales worth about $28 billion, including $1.24 billion worth of arms sales to expected future NATO member Finland, according to a foreign policy analysis of two years of data from the U.S. Defense Department's Security Cooperation Agency. While not all arms sales will be finalized with the same numbers outlined in the proposals, the sharp uptick in these plans reflects a massive shift in Europe's security landscape after Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in late February. After some European countries allowed their defense capabilities to atrophy for decades, Russia's invasion jolted Europe into a scramble to rapidly boost military spending. 
Everyone is trying to lock down arms sales deals as quickly as possible, said one Eastern European defense official who spoke to foreign policy on condition of anonymity. Russia's invasion has brought a cold new reality to Europe. You mean a cold war to Europe? It's brinksmanship. It's exactly what I've been saying it is. It's all about how, oh, all this money is awesome. And it says, the data showcases how the U.S. remains a major arms supplier for allies in Europe in the short term, even as Europe's own defense industries scramble to meet wartime demands for conventional arms and ammo. The flurry of new defense sales comes amid growing concerns in the West that NATO countries are running out of excess military equipment and munitions to send to Ukraine to aid its fight against the Russians. Defense officials and experts say Europe's defense industrial base is struggling to rapidly expand its capacities to keep pace with the new demand. <laughs> Europeans are extremely worried about not having enough of their own military equipment after sending so much to Ukraine, said Rachel Rizzo, a scholar at the Atlantic Council. That's a massive, massive globalist military industrial complex organization but okay we'll listen to them and they're also on board with the cbdc by the way which is why they're who i used for my cbdc tracker thing when i went over the countries that are adopting cbdc's because they're all celebrating that too the u.s certainly plays a role in helping here which is evidenced by the increase in arms sales in 2022 compared to 2021 However, it's also, it also highlights that Europe needs to get its act together in the security and defense realm. At this phase in the war, Ukraine is firing some 4,000 to 7,000 rounds of artillery a day, rapidly using up munitions delivered by the West shortly after they arrive. Okay. So, that's where we are here. Right? On these foreign policy articles. Where they're saying, shame on you if you don't want your country to hemorrhage money to Ukraine. To hemorrhage arms to Ukraine. And then another one where it says countries are worried about running out of their domestic supply. So which the fuck is it? Are they running low and should maybe focus on themselves? After getting involved in a massive geopolitical conflict? Or... Do they have plenty and they're being stingy Nazis for not doing it? Propagandist garbage. Holy shit. So I thought I would go over that. And then I thought I would go over a few other things that are sort of inconvenient to their present narrative that they super need this. Starting with uh, this anti-war article. Uh, which goes over some uh, thinkers who are certainly not Putin apologists who are critical of this conflict. Um, and I'll just scroll through them because I feel like uh, if you want to read these, you can go read the article yourself. But these people are all critical of it for very similar reasons to what I've been saying. Like, that's one of the things. Like, if you're going to call me some sort of, like, greasy, long hair hippie kind of guy, uh, sure. Maybe. But you know what? These people agree with me and they are not greasy and long-haired. If anything, they trend more toward the bald category. Um, they aren't hippies. They aren't hippies. They're conservatives, even, some of them. And they support a more peace-forward position. So, you can't just ad hom me. That's, that's, that's the thing to start with here. You can't just say that I'm some exotically evil person because I'm saying I don't think this much money should be being spent on anyone if we're not even at war officially with the people involved. Like, that seems reasonable. It seems reasonable that defense money should go to, you know, defense. Not, not this offensive brinksmanship garbage that's exactly reminiscent of Cold War and the armament of the Mujahideen, who then became the, like, every single terror organization the U.S. would later claim to fight. 
They made those. They made Al-Qaeda. They made the Taliban. They made these people because they formed their foundations. The CIA literally gives them money hand over fist for decades and then says, Oh shit, this is a threat! Yeah, no shit, Zabignev. <laughs> and then his daughter gets a job at MB MSNBC. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's almost too good to write, you know? And, and like, this is the, the surface of it, right? It gets deeper. Why? Because the U.S. Department of Defense, this year, this year, when the U.S. is not under attack, when the U.S. is not at war officially with any country, just has some sofas with some places, this year, when the U.S. has the opportunity to lay off the gas, not only are they throwing so much at Ukraine, but would you looky here? $1.64 trillion for what? Well, they're occupying a third of Syria. They're occupying uh, Yemen to help with the Saudi conflict. They're occupying so many other places, like they're back in Somalia. Um, they still have an interest in Afghanistan because, like I said, they made that situation and they're not going to leave. You know, they've got so many places they are, um, and they've stretched themselves thin enough that they need $1.64 trillion. <laughs> and if we start to lay off the gas on defense spending, we're Nazis for some reason. Because I guess Nazis are defense spending doves? It's, it's not true, but it's there. And meanwhile, you, you know what uh, CNBC is saying? The U.S. defense industry faces a surging demand and supply crunch. <laughs> it's hilarious. They say... The war in Ukraine and rising tensions over Taiwan have caused demand for high-tech American-made weapons to surge. And with the ongoing supply chain crunch and inflation continuing to rise, military industry watchers question whether the U.S. defense sector can keep up. We can't rely on China to build components for our weapons, which is to some extent potentially what we have done, whether knowingly or not, said Elbridge Colby, co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative. Even with the largest defense budget in the world, U.S. military is not immune to supply chain challenges. But with an already massive budget and questions on Pentagon spending, some critics think that more funds may not be the answer. You, you think? I want to highlight this next part because it's actually good. Next year's national security budget will likely be nearly a trillion and a half dollars said Julia Gledhill, an analyst at the Center for Defense Information at the Project of Government Oversight. And Congress wants to add tens of billions of dollars to that number, despite the fact that the DOD has shown time and time again that it's not managing its finances effectively. Nah, you think? So, they include, like, one credit, probably because they needed to match their fairness doctrine, but... Let's be super clear here that they've done that while also co-signing the war effort almost consistently. So the CNBC knows exactly what they're doing. And, 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 and here's the great thing. When you, when you look at the, uh, the aid that's already been enacted uh, for Ukraine, uh, you see a ton of... An absolute fucking ton from the U.S. It's already gotten a hundred billion dollars, um, which was like the total after this was done and written, because this was done and written in no uh, on November eighteenth, twenty twenty two. It's gotten much more since then. Much more has been approved in an omnibus bill, um, and this was already what was enacted and proposed, which is fucking insane. And like, notice, most of it is military. There's a tiny amount for humanitarian efforts. Um, and just a ton directly to the Ukrainian government. Just, here's a check. It's not even for defense, just, this is to help you administer shit. 
So it says U.S. aid uh, to Ukraine totals $68 billion, and the White House has just asked Congress for another $37.7 billion. It worked. In the spring, the new Congress will consider aid in the context of the administration's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget. With these decisions ahead, it is worth reviewing how much aid there has been, what aid does, and what the administration is requesting. No shit! But even asking that question makes you a Nazi, according to Foreign Policy magazine. So, to get to some of these other things that I have listed here, um, because I think it's valuable to remember, um, Forbes recently accurately covered, hey, maybe the U.S. has a business to run. And that's the reason it's doing this. Maybe the U.S. is kind of problematic. And this was in March that they released this, but they said, We are number one. The U.S. government is the world's largest arms dealer. Again, it's very celebratory in nature. But it says, The uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute uh, came out with its annual analysis of the global arms trade this week. And as usual, the U.S. was the number one weapons exporter by a large margin. For the five years from 2017 to 2021, the U.S. accounted for 39% of major arms deliveries worldwide, over twice what Russia transferred and nearly 10 times what China sent to its weapons clients. In addition, the U.S. had far more customers, 103 nations, or more than half of the member states of the United Nations. The rapid arming of Ukraine to defend itself against Russia's invasion has put weapons transfers squarely in the public eye, but few Americans know how extensive the U.S. trade is, or that their government is intimately involved in it, either through the foreign ministry sales, uh, deals brokered by the Pentagon, or direct commercial sales licensed by the State Department. In essence, the U.S. government is the world's largest arms dealer, with all the responsibility that that entails. The Center for Civilians in Conflict underscored this point in its January 2018 report with great power modifying U.S. arms sales to reduce civilian harm, which provided a series of practical recommendations on how to avoid situations in which U.S. arms fall into the wrong hands or become associated with corruption, human rights abuses, violations of the laws of war, and human suffering. Unfortunately, current U.S. policy continues to fall short by all of these measures. Wow! So it goes on to say that the volume of U.S. arms offers under the Foreign Military Sales Program, the largest channel for U.S. weapons exports, dropped significantly during the first year of the Biden administration, in part because key markets were saturated by sales made by the U.S. and other major exporters over the past few years. To its credit, the Biden administration is not engaged in the sort of vocal, aggressive promotion of arms sales that have prevailed during the Trump years, but it has fallen short in its pledge to limit sales to regimes that repress their own people and wage unjust wars outside their borders. Two prominent cases in point are Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So, basically, this is as dovish as this article gets. The U.S. literally supports Saudi Arabia while it's committing human rights abuses. And others. But, like, they're totally on the good guy's side. Because getting oil from Saudi Arabia is so different from getting oil from Russia. Because Saudi Arabia's victims aren't white. Just gonna... Ooh, did I say that? So, with that in mind, um, the policy sort of tends to look a little bit worse when you put it through the lens of money. Because even the CFR says that, quote, the... Global arms trade is big business, and the U.S. accounts for more than 40% of the world's weapons exports. Aside from the profit motivation, selling arms abroad can be an effective foreign policy tool, allowing the U.S. to exert influence over conflict and security worldwide without having to put boots on the ground. No shit, right? Man, 
that would be that would be a pretty spicy thing for somebody not affiliated with the global security state to say. So it's almost like they allow people to say these things as long as they continue to support the agenda. Meanwhile, uh, the U.S. and NATO, according to New York Times, scramble to arm Ukraine and refill their own arsenals. The West thought artillery and tank war in Europe would never happen again and shrank weapons stockpiles. It was wrong. That's the propaganda we're dealing with here. Oh man, oh shucks, we made an error. We did an oopsie. We got two little weapons. Poor us. Now we need more weapons because Ukraine. You remember when I kept saying that they were doing all this so that they would be able to like produce and test a bunch more weapons? I was right. That was produced, that article, in November 26th, 2022. That's where it was. November 26th, 2022. They came out with that. And, and you know what else came out around then? October 11th? This article from Breaking Defense that says, Wow, U.S. arms sales rebound back to $50 billion in fiscal year 2022. Quote, I would say that we have enjoyed a rebound in arms sales, said Defense Security Cooperation Agency Director James Hirsch. I think that there will be, over the next three years or so, continuing increases. I'm not sure how steep this slope will be. And it goes on to say, the boost to foreign military sales deals approved by the State Department, roughly $15 billion over fiscal year 21's totals, brings fiscal year 22 in line with annual cleared sales from before the COVID-19 pandemic, said Defense Security Cooperation Agency Director James Hirsch, who announced the total today at the Association for U.S. Army Conference. And what has that done? Well, it's kept their stocks high while the S&P, if you, if you look at this, I don't, I don't see how this couldn't be damning evidence that this is about money. Oh no, you didn't give these people enough money. You didn't give U.S. being the arms dealer of the world, you didn't give U.S. defense companies enough money. You must be a Nazi. And this all just brings me back to that initial article where they were condemning Germany for saying maybe we should ease up off the gas with this Ukraine support. Because, oh no, they might be, they might be not buying our agenda. They might not be thinking that we're completely pure and innocent and awesome. So that must mean they're Nazis. This is what we're dealing with, folks. You're either a Kremlin stooge or a Nazi or disloyal traitor. Just throw an insult at the wall. That's what they'll call you if you're anti-war. That's what they'll call you if you call for fiscal responsibility. It's absolutely disgusting. But that's who we're dealing with. Truly disgusting people. Now, not all of Ukraine is disgusting. I would not remotely say that. I'm not saying that Ukraine is entirely made up of disgusting people. But what I am saying is don't believe the hype. Don't let these military industrialists, these mega corporate, mega statist assholes, convince you that the only way to support freedom is to support their agenda in Ukraine. It's sick, and it's getting people killed needlessly while they rake in the profits. Because this is not going to stop. It's not going to stop anytime fucking soon, as long as they keep making billions of dollars from it, as long as they keep on celebrating it, as long as they keep on saying that this is awesome, that we're back in business, baby! And they will call you a Nazi if you disagree with them. So, with that being said, I just figured I would give y'all 
this extra added little push of a reason in the first vlog of 2023 to smash the fucking 